everybody, it's Daisy here today, and we'll be working on a tiger, but more importantly, we would like to encourage you to try different medias when it comes to a composition that you might personally be working on. As in the case of the tiger, we'll be working with watercolors and with graphites. We'll be doing everything that we do in both uh, aspects. That means we will be shading, coloring, giving dimension and depth and brightness and highlights and lowlights but we'll be doing it in two medias. This is a spin on a traditional technique. It, so when you work on something that's, uh, that you're trying to make unique, consider doing it in a variety of media, not just one. And this particular project will showcase just that. So here we go. First off, we wanna plan out our paper. So the tiger's head is going to take the first chunk up there and the leg portion about the same at the bottom as is the body. This tells me where I want to place the first marking, which is the nose. So I'm going to start with my nose and I'm going to build up all around it. And here we go. Once the nose is done, I create lines that pull up the front of his face. And then I also bring the mouth lines to round off around the nose for the top of his mouth area. This allows me placement for my eyes and it also lets me know where I want to place the lower part of my jaw. The eyes can never be done in just a single stroke. Pay attention to the way in which eyes are created, which means you would break them down into not one, maybe two or three lines just to get the right angle and curve on an eye. The inside of the eye, the iris, is circular in a tiger's eye. There is a very dramatic look that um, kind of showcases the entire eye. There's a black that goes right from the top all the way around and to the tear duct. So those are very, very distinct and we want to give them a lot of emphasis. The ears are placed from the outside corner of the eye. That's where they would start, right directly above the eye and then they would branch out. The curve to the head in the middle between the two ears and now we'll connect up the face from the sides. So I like to know where the muscle structure typically goes. So I do draw all the lines that I see, as you will see here. And there's a multitude of them that you can easily make out when you look at a picture of a tiger coming down to the tiger's legs. His left leg, the front left leg, is in a position where he's resting on it. And so that's what we'd make, finishing off with the paw, and we just create outlines. Whenever I draw, I do not try to go for details. Now his second front leg, again, I align with the face, and I try and see as to where I wanna place the leg in conjunction with the first leg, in conjunction with the head. This helps me to make my drawing a lot more accurate. I drew a line for the belly and for the back. And when I do draw a line, I try and draw it through and through. And you notice that I went over my arm, but I took it off after a while. This is to help me understand where the leg would start and stop, where the belly would start and stop. Everything flows into each other. So if you think about it, when in the case of a picture such as this, where the tiger is sitting down and his legs are kind of over each other or his arm is in front of his belly, you still need to know where you would draw the line, which is why don't hesitate to draw through and through and create the lines that let you understand where you see the tiger's various parts of his body and anatomy. Once we're almost done with the basic drawing of our tiger, then we would move into 
making sure that we get the proportions accurately. And just a final look at it, hold up your picture in front of you and step away from it. That will give you the best perspective on how you like the actual picture. Our next, next task is to create the stripes, the prominent ones that we see in our reference picture and apply them to our drawing. I don't try to draw stripes very fast. I try to make, take care of muscle formation and where the stripe would curve, where would it be more straighter. All these things are very, very important if you want the level of your art to be much higher than you normally get it. Do not assume things are what they are. Trust your eyes. Your eyes will always guide you when you draw. One stripe at a time. Take your time to create them. Do not be in a rush because this is very distinct features of a tiger. They make or break a picture, so take your time to place them and to create them. The process of making the stripes is a long one. It's very arduous, so don't give up hope too soon. But it is what will make you feel like it was all worth it. So take your time on it. You'll start seeing a very distinct characteristic of the tiger itself based on how well and accurately your placement of your lines goes. Coming down to the body, same story. I want to pay attention to muscle structure and how the stripe curves over the body. Very, very important. Cannot undermine this. Whenever I've drawn with my students in a class and tiger happens to be one of our more popular subjects, so we've done it frequently enough. I never let my students run away with the stripes on their own. We do them one at a time as a group and they get the chance to really see how much they can give to the picture. They all love it. At the end of it, it is never oohs and ahs about it taking too much time, but oohs and ahs about it looks so good. So it's all worth it. Just don't have to feel like there's a clock on you. Art is personal. It's your space, it's your time. You don't have to feel that you have to rush it on account of anybody. So give yourself as much time as you need. When you feel it's a lot on you for a day, step away. There is nothing wrong in stepping away from a composition and coming back with what we call a fresh pair of eyes and just work yourself into it again. It's pretty straightforward and easy to pick up where you leave off. Now we're on our legs and we'll keep going one stripe at a time. That's the key to the whole thing. And just remember, stripes don't necessarily curve all the way around a leg, a belly or something. They may be long or short. They may curve. They may not. They may be just a spot. But you have to capture every single thing that you can. The underside of the tiger's foot has paws, just like a dog or a cat. And you want to capture it. So if it shows in your reference picture, understand it, look at it, and draw it. Notice that on one of my arms, I have no stripes at all, but that's because the reference picture doesn't show any. I'm creating a horizon line. A horizon is where the land meets the sky. And in our case, our tiger is sitting crouched over the edge of almost like a cliff-like area. So that's why his hand is hanging. And I'm going to create a little bit of a rocky edge right here just to give it, make everything feel more natural because of the way his arm is hanging. And that will complete my drawing for the most part of it. Now I'm slicing down. 
and I want to know which part I would actually want to do graphite on and where would I want to put watercolors. And that's the way that I would like to have this composition. It's personal. When you do your own picture and portrait, then you are entitled to dividing a subject to your liking. It doesn't have to be by any rules or norms. We're going into watercolors first, and we're going to go in with a very dark color to the background. So I'm pulling out um, a paints gray, which is a very, very dark gray, and I'm going to apply it to the back. I'm going to paint it first with water, and then put the paints gray over it. This helps watercolors to move much more efficiently on the surface of the paper. And wherever I wanna enhance it with a darker color tone, I can do so by just reapplying and layering it down a little bit more with every coat that I create on this one. I would like to give the feeling of a very, very dark entrance to perhaps like a cave behind the tiger. So I'm gonna make my darkest dark in the paint gray closer to the tiger's head and the rest of it will be more wash-like. I take my time to create the contours very, very nicely and accurately. It's important that it's not messy. Watercolors are moved by the water that you bring to the paper. It's as simple as that. So if you want to go lighter, darker, or if you want to clean up an edge, just a tiny bit of water on your brush will do it. I'm still working with the same exact paint gray, but it's much more watered down for the front area where the tiger is sitting. I would choose to do the entire background in a wash effect, just so as I can keep a consistency there. So again, I don't have to divide the entire composition completely in half. I can pick and choose areas that I wanna work on. Remember, every time you add another layer of color over the first, you get a darker tone and a darker one and a darker one. So layers create more value, value is basically light or dark uh, of anything, whether it's pencil or color. So you keep working on that as you feel you would like to see it. This is all very personal. Remember, any part where two parts come together, so whether it's the arm resting over the cliff or whether it's the belly resting on the stone, all those areas should have a shadow that casts over the underlying stone. So that's what you need to, as a rule of thumb, you want to know that. And even if the picture reference doesn't show it, sometimes it needs a shading there. We're going to do the wa watercolors on the tiger first. We're not uh, doing the graphite first. I want everything to dry up. Then I'll go to the next part. So here we go the green to the eyes. I start off with the tone that I would like to have all over the tiger's eye and then I bring in darker hues. I pull away from the bottom of the eye because if you look closely at any photograph of a tiger which shows you their eyes, the lower part of the eye is generally brighter than the top of the eye. And that's why that's what brings depth to the eye. And when you leave a bright spot in the eye, that's what gives life to it. So think about these things as you work on different parts of your tiger. Remember, watercolors are alive and active all the time. So when you are working with two contrasting colors, like a gray with a yellow, be very careful with the edge of your brush that you do not pull in from the edge of the darker areas to your bright yellows on the tiger's body. Be very steady in your hand and you will be just fine. I like to give a wash effect all over the areas where I feel that there needs to be the golden hue that is traditional to tigers. 
but in the case of our tiger, not the entire body is a golden hue. There are prominent white areas in the tiger's body, and there are prominent golden areas to the body. So I have to pick and choose. It's important that the edge of any area you paint be very sharp and crisp. If you have a very uneven, jaggedy kind of an edge, that won't really cut it in terms of quality. And the easiest way to fix watercolors is to take a brush with simply water on it and just smooth over the line and you'll get a perfect even edge. Coming down for the legs, most of the lower body on our tiger is not in any kind of a golden hue. All the golden hue was either on the face or the upper back. We're looking at more whites and grays here. And the stripes, of course, are dark, but the stripes will go on at the very end as it's a black that we need. But I'm thinking I'll probably stick with the paints gray. I like its effect. We don't always have to go on top of a black area as jet black. It doesn't always have to be that way. One of the ways that I like to work with watercolors is by applying a concentrated value to one side of um, the area that I plan to color and then cleaning up the brush and just taking water on the tip of that same brush and dragging the paint out wherever I want it. So it's a gradient kind of an effect. And I like it because it gives me maximum control on my watercolors, especially if I'm looking at doing gradients. That's the way that I would choose to do it. So when you watch this video, a lot of times you'll see me applying a concentrated color and then pulling it out. And that's the reason why I do it that way. I can really control what I want, where I want. So the darkest area will stay the darkest, but the lighter areas can be uh, layered up a little bit more if I want to increase the value or not. The area around the paws of a uh, tiger's foot is darkest. The paw itself, the padding under the foot, just like a cat or a dog, is actually a lighter tone. So it, it gives me a, like, um, the way that I do it is I just contour first. And then I use from that value to create the lighter shadings on the padded areas. Again, take your time. Um, detail is everything. Clean, crisp lines make for a higher value of art uh, in everybody's eyes. Otherwise, you might want to just stick to Impressionism, whereby you don't have to stick with clean, crisp lines and you can make your art more impressionistic.
adding the shadows under the belly, under the face. Definitely there would be shadow on the arm, so I want to make sure that I give it there. The dark pitched against the lighter areas gives the feeling of dimension and depth and it also brings a very strong amount of boldness to a composition. creating the final stripes on my tiger's face, I would take my time on it. And the stripes would not necessarily always be a perfect solid line. Because remember, the stripes are also like fur on a tiger's body. They would be stroked in versus being solid bold lines. The area in the mouth and around it, there is a concentrated value of darkness in the very center of the mouth. And as you move away from it, it spreads out. creating a little bit of a fur effect wherever I see it. I take care of details as I go. Stripes to the body. Remember the contouring around the body makes or breaks an animal's picture. The direction of the fur will change direction based on where the fur is located, top of the head, under the eye, on the lower side of the mouth. All of these will change perspective. Nails and claws. Again, just like I did in the previous sections, create a concentrated line, use the value from that line because watercolors are always active. So you can still pull from colors that have been done with a wet paintbrush and you can use that value anywhere else in the painting if you wanted to. Keep going back to check on what I need. Here are my shadows, like I talked about earlier. The very center of the nose is not the darkest part. It's the top and the sides.
when I bring the black into the tiger space very gently I can create fur effects from the outside in versus trying to stroke from the tiger out so you can think of doing things like that And this just brings us to our graphite area. We're going to use a stump. That's what I'm working with right now. A stump is nothing more than a piece of paper that's rolled up and it acts as a blending tool. My choice of pencil is a 6B. I put down a value somewhere and then I use my stump and a swatch. So that little black smudge that you see on the side paper, that is called a swatch where I can use put a lot of 6b carbon on there and then i can use my blending tool to spread out the values as i want to use them everything doesn't have to be done in with a pencil directly on a picture you can create a lot of shadows uh, and general overall hues using the blending tool and a swatch and keep it very very controlled another reason why you would want to use um why you'd want to use a swat uh, a stump and a swatch is because it gets very forgiving when you want to erase away some spaces some negative spaces to create fur effects and other things but if you go on directly with a pencil and then you want to erase certain parts of it and that to a 6B pencil, at that point you find that you're not able to erase away as well as you could have. And that's one of the reasons to try to use a stamp and swatch a lot more for the majority of it. The pencil comes in when you really want to go in for the darkest, darkest areas that you see or you anticipate seeing but you don't need to use it on other parts. Another thing to remember as you work on compositions, whether you're using a sketching pencil or you're working with colored media, as you apply color or shading to one part, you will find a, a part that you, another part that you've already worked on may need a touch up. And it happens very often. So don't feel that it's what just happened and that's not what I anticipated. Don't feel negatively towards having to go back to touch up. This is a part and pro a part of the whole process. You have to allow yourself time to touch up. So as I add more lines and I keep looking back at my previous areas and I feel like I want to re-enhance my eye in relation to other things or I want to reinforce the fur here, I keep going back. And that's what you're noticing a lot here, that I'm constantly having to go back to areas that I've already done and retouch and retouch and retouch. But if I don't, I won't feel content. This little blending tool is an amazing thing to have. So if you don't have one that you can use, try rolling up a piece of paper, give it a nice sharp point and use it for blending. The reason I'd rather not use my hands and fingers is our hands tend to have some natural oils that would transfer over to our composition. And that affects the way that the um, uh, carbon will work on your paper. And it can sometimes 
halt its progress. It can um, restrict how you spread and use the medium. So I prefer using blending tools just so as I can avoid that situation. A little darkness to the top of the eye. Bringing in a little bit more value to the inner corner of the eye. And a little bit of a reverse flow onto the top and the ears and everything to make the fur part look a bit more natural. Remember, you are the best judge of what you feel about your artwork. So do things for yourself and nobody else. And here we go, let's unmask it. Always pull the tape out at a 45 degree angle to the paper and hold the paper down firmly as you do it. Don't be in a rush to do it. It can rip away some of the paper as you go through the process.